hey, look, you can look at a clock. Uh, you can hope that your oven is telling the truth. You can follow the recipe commands precisely. You can guess, you can gash, you can poke, you can stab your food, but none of that is gonna be necessary once you know the 26 most important temperatures in cooking, and I'm gonna tell you what they are today on the Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cooks Code every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cooks Code. Hey, welcome back to the Carefree Cooks Code, everyone. Uh, this is the weekly show for the methods, techniques, and insights into better food and cooking. We're live every Tuesday at noon Eastern. And if you want to look for some past videos, go to the archive on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash chef dot dot more slash videos. You'll find a few years <laughs> worth of videos there. Why do we do it? Well, because we're carefree cooks. I'm a carefree cook. I create my own recipes. I bring friends and family together. I learn every time I cook, not become more confused. <laughs> I create my own cooking style because I practice pro methods and I wind up loving my cooking. Hey, welcome back everyone. Another Tuesday where I'm so thrilled to be together and share some important insights about cooking so you can become more free. You can become more proud. You can be empowered, enlightened, elevated in your cooking. That's my mission in life. And one of the most important parts of becoming truly free in your cooking, moving forward on your path to becoming a truly carefree cook, is to stop giving away the control of your cooking to vague instructions and measurements. Oh my goodness, <laughs> how much will your cooking improve if you stop cooking to medium or medium high? What the heck is medium high? I have no idea. Let's not, let's stop listening to recipe instructions, things that tell you don't overcook. No kidding! I hadn't planned to overcook it, but now that you reminded me, great, thanks. Let's stop scratching our heads. Let's stop poking our palms. Let's stop looking at a clock to tell you when you should stop cooking. The way to do all of these things and become free is to quantify you're cooking as much as you can. That means a thermometer, and that means 26 important temperatures that you're gonna find in your kitchen. But first, I've got a what am I for you today. Ooh, pretty flower, what do you know? Uh, tell me in the comment section below, what am I? It's obviously a flower, but there must be more to it. Don't write, I'm a flower. <laughs> Don't write the obvious thing. In the comment section below, tell me why I'm showing you the picture of this flower. Okay, look. If you're a carefree cook, all right, if you are someone who is on a personal culinary journey to own, all right, I mean, seriously, own the hows and whys behind cooking, that's where I wanna take you to. You own the hows and whys behind cooking, and that's so you can cook with creativity, confidence, and pride, right? Those three things that we talk about all the time, cooking with creativity, confidence, and pride, and one naturally follows the other. Well, one of the best ways to speed your journey along is to quantify your cooking. Think about this. When you drive your car, the speedometer shows you how fast you're going. When you drive your car, the odometer shows you how far you're going. You don't just look at the trees whizzing by. Right? You, just, you don't look out the side window and just guess how fast you're going. You, you don't tra-la-la, th uh, sing 10 songs and figure out how far you're going. There are things that can quantify speed and distance. If your home is really cold in the winter, you turn up the thermostat 
to a specific temperature. I bet everybody has a one degree tolerance the human body is very, very delicate. You've got a one or two degree tolerance in your home. You know exactly what you've got that thermostat set to. These are quantifiable things. Anybody that does woodworking, a carpenter knows the adage, measure twice and cut once. If you're going to build something, you need a ruler to figure out how long it is. You don't just guess, right? You need dimensions. So here's the thing. If you are not interested in adding something measurable, reliable, and quantifiable to your cooking. You're not, you're not interested. You, you just, you would rather continue guessing. You, you'd rather continue, oops, some recipes work and some don't. You, you like the, um, the anticipation. It, it's exciting to you. Okay, that's good. So this is going to be one of the worst shows you've ever seen. This is going to be one of the most boring, carefree cook shows ever. If you don't care how cooking works. Because it's going to sound like I'm just reading off a list of temperatures. But this might be one of the most fascinating times that we have ever spent together because I'm about to share with you the 26 most important temperatures in cooking. So what? <laughs> All right, Chef Todd, why is this important? All right, if you can get through the next few minutes of me reading temperatures to you, you're also going to walk away with a ton of aha moments because you're going to start to see the relationship between some of these temperatures and what you've been noticing in the kitchen. Some of the mysteries about why things happen when they happen in your cooking are going to be solved today because you're going to see the temperature at which it happened. It's the speedometer. It's the odometer. It's the carpenter's measuring tape. This is going to blow your mind today. If you're interested, if you're not, it's going to suck. It's just going to be temperatures because this is part of the journey. If you're not on a journey, you don't need a map. If you are on a journey, a map helps you out tremendously. All right. And one disclaimer for the people that are really smart, smarter than me out there. I have rounded. Okay. I have averaged. I'm giving you a general idea of when things happen in the kitchen. Don't write me a dissertation uh, on the uh, uh, Molliard Malliard effect. And so it's cool. All right. This is for general information. But look, ultimately, it's up to you to observe what's going on. It's up for you to watch the effects of food and make judgments and adjustments for the next time. That's the path to carefree cooking, right? All right, let's get going. The 26 most important temperatures in your kitchen. Let's start with our thermometer here and creep our way up. Let's start at the bottom of it. Zero degrees Fahrenheit or minus 18 degrees Celsius. This should be the temperature of your freezer. Okay, this is storage of your food. One degree higher Fahrenheit will reduce the storage of your food by half a day. I've heard this, okay? Again, I'm generally quantifying, but let's not even put a time on it. The more your freezer goes up per degree, the less the quality of your food coming out of it goes. Because here's what happens. Your automatic uh, defrost cycle goes up and down. Your freezer's temperature goes like this. This is why your ice cubes get smaller. And this is why you have freezer burn or ice crystals. Um, one day I left my freezer ajar just a little bit. I didn't close it all the way. So air was getting in all night long. When I opened it the next day, it was like a snowstorm had occurred ice crystals on everything because of the temperature drop, the electric pump kicks on, the temperature drop is this kind of thing. Keep your freezer at a consistent temperature. Your food lasts longer in there. You should have a freezer thermometer, by the way. If you don't have one, get a $5, $10 freezer thermometer, put it in your freezer. Next, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees Celsius. This is when water freezes, an important temperature in cooking. If you need ice, if you were ever going to vent a stock, which means you have a big bowl of ice and then a smaller bowl with your hot liquid. It's what I do when I brine my salmon that I smoke. I make a brine uh, from brown sugar and maple and bourbon and whiskey and uh, all kinds of other things from the bar. And it has to come to a boil to dissolve the salt and the sugar. But then I can't put boiling liquid on cold salmon that I'm going to smoke. It needs to be vented and brought down to a temperature. That's how I do it quickly. 
one bowl inside another surrounded by ice poured in. It's called venting. 38 degrees Fahrenheit, 3.3 degrees Celsius. This should be the temperature of your refrigerator. Your refrigerator should be 40 degrees Fahrenheit or below. Once again, each temperature higher than that is the less amount of time that your food is stored in the refrigerator. Get yourself a refrigerator thermometer as well. Make sure that you know when your refrigerator is above 40 degrees because it starts to ruin all the rest of the food. It's another reason that you don't take like a, a casserole right out of the oven and you put it in your refrigerator to cool down because you heat up everything else in the refrigerator. Don't do it. One of the most important temperatures in all of cooking is 40 degrees Fahrenheit or four and a half degrees Celsius. This is the bottom of the temperature danger zone. And you'll hear me talk about this. The temperature danger zone is the area in which bacteria grows most rapidly. The warmer the temperature, the more bacteria doubles in, uh, in number and the more your food becomes potentially contaminated. So 40 degrees Fahrenheit, four and a half Celsius is the the temperature that you want to cool leftovers to within four hours. This is the temperature, again, that your refrigerator should be at least. This is the temperature anything that goes into your refrigerator to be a leftover should be at. This is the temperature that you should try and keep your picnic foods at if you can. It's the bottom of the temperature danger zone. Whoops. There we go. Uh, as I mentioned, it is also the temperature that you want to cool your leftovers within four hours. They need to be, they need to come to 70 degrees Fahrenheit within two, 40 degrees Fahrenheit within seven to remain totally safe. Uh, 88 degrees Fahrenheit or 31 degrees Celsius. This is the temperature chocolate melts. And I'm talking about real chocolate. Okay. Not fake chocolate coating, couverture, uh, things that have oils added to them. Real chocolate is five ingredients, sugar, cocoa butter, cocoa liquor, lecithin, and vanilla. If it has any more than those five ingredients, it is not real chocolate. With all due respect to my friends in the UK who like to put milk in their chocolate, it is then flavored chocolate. So the chocolate that has sugar, cocoa butter, cocoa liqueur, lecithin, and vanilla melts at 88 degrees Fahrenheit, 31 degrees Celsius. This is why you melt chocolate in a double boiler. You don't ever put chocolate directly on the stove. 93 degrees Fahrenheit or 33 degrees Celsius. This is the melting point of butter. We're going to talk more about this, but this is why things that are cooked with butter, things that are cooked in butter, uh, melt in your mouth because the next temperature is 98 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 Celsius. This is the temperature in your mouth. So now this might not be a kitchen temperature, but it's a very important temperature to know when things melt in your mouth and not in your hands. Nonetheless. Uh, so if butter melts at 93 degrees Fahrenheit, anything cooked in butter, uh, sauteed in butter is going to melt and affect your taste buds. When you start to use shortening, when you start to use inverse fats, things that melt at a higher temperature than 93 Fahrenheit, that's when you get that coating in your mouth. Uh, let me uh, challenge you to try this. Go to your local donut shop uh, where they deep fry the donuts. <clears throat> get a donut, but don't get coffee. Don't get hot coffee that washes that fat down your throat. Get yourself an iced tea or cold water. Bite the donut, drink the cold water. Tell me if your mouth is encoded because of the uh, melting point of fats. 93 degrees butter melts, 98 degrees the temperature in your mouth. What if this changed, right? In a, in a, in a mutant kind of world, what if things melted at 100 degrees in your mouth? It would kind of change the whole baking world. What if things melted at 88 degrees in your mouth? It would change cooking entirely. I'll write a Ray Bradbury-ish culinary novel on that one time. 105 degrees Fahrenheit, 41 degrees Celsius. This is where yeast blooms. Those that are bakers, you might be killing your yeast if you're putting it in liquid that is too hot. 105 to 110 is the best temperature for yeast to get going for uh, uh, bread, baking bread. 110 degrees Fahrenheit. This is where human skin burns. Um, important temperature, wouldn't you think? So the, the, the heat of the water coming out of your faucet in your home 
generally is not hot enough to cook with. You can usually put your finger under your faucet and if you go, ow, ow, it's 110 degrees. Just think about the fact that water boils, right? At, at 100 degrees Celsius, 212 Fahrenheit, you got a long way to go. This is why we don't cook with water out of the tap, but 110 is where, you're, will, where you will burn skin. 110 Fahrenheit, 43 degrees Celsius, is where eggs accept air best. This is important for the kitchen as well, uh, for the bake shop. If you ever make meringues, uh, if you ever make uh, custards, uh, if you do Italian butter creams, if you're in the bake shop and you're using egg whites, egg yolks, whole eggs, bringing them to 110 degrees over a warm water bath gives you a lot more volume in the bake shop, gives you a much higher chiffon on your pie, things like that. Eggs accept air best at 110. It relaxes the proteins. At 115, <clears throat> there's only a small range for that chocolate. This is when chocolate burns and gets grainy. So anybody that tempers chocolate to try and make their own Easter candy or Valentine's Day candy or likes to make filigree for their desserts or likes to coat plates, all the things that you can do with chocolate, if 115 is where you've got to stop because then it starts to burn and get grainy. All right, let's talk about some proteins. 125 degrees Fahrenheit, 72 degrees Celsius. This is where your steak would be rare. Your proteins are rare. Fish, if uh, like tuna, very rare, rare, rare to cook fish rare, but tuna is one of them. 125 degrees Fahrenheit, if you like your food, your steak's rare. 140 degrees Fahrenheit, 60 degrees Celsius, this is right about your medium, okay? <clears throat> Pardon. Next temperature, 140 degrees Fahrenheit or uh, 60 degrees Celsius. Well, let me just go back one. So we've got rare and medium. What I wanted to mention is you should have a steak number. You should have a personal steak number. You should know exactly to the temperature where you like, if you eat beef, if you cook beef on the outside, um, or any of the other things that are have a variety of, of temperatures that you could cook, cook them at, quantify that. Know what is yours because that not only gives you consistency that it comes out the same way each time, but also it enables you to cook someone a little more rare than yours, a little more well done than yours. It gives you a great benchmark. Okay, uh, 140 degrees Fahrenheit, 60 degrees Celsius, foods are fully cooked and safe to hold. Uh, this is a caterer's thing. If you ever throw parties, if you go to potlucks at uh, uh, holiday time, that food sitting on the table, if it's not in a crock pot, it should be 140 degrees Fahrenheit or 60 degrees Celsius. As a caterer, whenever I ran a buffet, as the executive chef of a large hospital, I always had to go out and check the temperature of the food, write it on a log at uh, different increments, half hourly or hourly, I don't remember to make sure that it was being held hot correctly. 145 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, this is the pasteurization of milk. Uh, anybody that's living on a farm getting raw milk that wants to pasteurize it, it is brought to 145 degrees Fahrenheit for about 30 minutes. Difficult to do at home because it's tough to keep it at that temperature for 30 minutes, but this is the pasteurization of milk. 150 Fahrenheit, 65 degrees Celsius. This is one of the four effects of heat on food. This is the entire basis of web cooking classes is cooking by the four effects of heat on food. So if you've ever cooked rice, if you've ever made potatoes, if you have ever watched pasta swell, get bigger than when it was dry in the box, you have witnessed gelatinization of starches. Starches absorb liquids and swell. An important tenant of all of cooking is gen, gen, uh, gelatinization of starches. This is how you thicken sauce. This is what your roux does. This is what your cornstarch slurry does. It's gelatinization of starches. 150 Fahrenheit, 65 Celsius also. This is where egg whites coagulate. Egg whites and egg yolks coagulate, cook, stiffen and shrink at different temperatures. This is why it is a lot easier to burn an egg white omelet than it is a whole egg scrambled egg omelet. An egg white omelet is a lot more difficult to cook. It is a lot more sensitive because the proteins coagulate at a lower temperature. 
150 Fahrenheit or 65 degrees Celsius. This is the third of medium well, a medium, a rare medium well. This is the temperature that proteins are well done, quote unquote, well done that you would cook them to. 160 degrees Fahrenheit or 71 Celsius. This is a proper poach in liquid. If you're going to poach something, the uh, visual cues are no bubbles in a poaching liquid and a slight convection moving around. If you can keep a liquid, hopefully a flavorful liquid, at 160 degrees Fahrenheit, you can maintain a proper poach and cook something very well. 162 Fahrenheit or 72 Celsius, this is the pasteurization of eggs. And we use this temperature for only 15 seconds. So if you have a commercially pasteurize the commercially safe egg, the, the brands that, that advertise this, this is what they're doing. Now, if you want to do hard boiled eggs, that's a different story. Hard boiled eggs, of course, are never actually boiled. They're held at a much lower temperature. This is the type of thing that the, the boiling bag stick would do very well for you because it holds that temperature. 165 degrees Fahrenheit, 74 degrees Celsius, the second of our four effects of heat on food, something culinary college students have got to know inside out and backwards because it is the science behind cooking, but this is coagulation of proteins, the stiffening and shrinking of a protein. Raw hamburger this big, cooked hamburger that big. Raw chicken breast this big, cooked chicken breast that big. This is such an important temperature in cooking because this is when you start to recognize that things are done. Things are cooked and done in, when you start to see the proteins coagulate and the moisture rise. We talk about this in grilling a lot also. Also 165 Fahrenheit, 74 Celsius, this is where most bacteria is destroyed. So if you cook to that temperature and then if you're going to hold it hot, it can only fall 25 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember 140 in the chafing dish on the buffet, but it has to be cooked to at least 165 to reduce bacteria to an acceptable level. Uh, I used to teach the food safety and sanitation course, and I was always careful to say this does not destroy all bacteria. This is not sanitize your food. It reduces to an acceptable level. You could then take it and sit it out in the sun and the bacteria would come back. All right. It reduces it to a level that is safe for consumption. 165 Fahrenheit, 74 Celsius is also the temperature you want to bring those leftovers back to. Make sure that your food is safe and all bacteria is destroyed. 185 Fahrenheit or 85 Celsius, this is a simmer. This is where water simmers. Poach is the lowest temperature. Uh, slight motion to the water, no bubbles. Simmer is a little bit higher. Small bubbles around the edge of your pan, more convection to the liquid, but not large violent bubbles. 185 Fahrenheit is also the finished temperature for whole poultry. Uh, we said 165 for uh, grilled items, for most items, but if you have a carcass, something with a cage, you're going to want to cook it even higher. Um, I've been pulling crabs out of my backyard. When I put them in the water, they go to 180 as well because they're dirty, nasty little buggers, aren't they? 212 Fahrenheit, 100 Celsius, the third of the four effects of heat on food, the temperature at which water boils. Boil, large, violent bubbles, heavy motion to the liquid. This is not something that you cook. This is a bad way to treat your food. You simmer or poach things if you're cooking in a moist convection uh, process. Let's get to sugar stages. Uh, uh, at 235 degrees Fahrenheit, 113 Celsius, this is the soft ball sugar stage. If you're into making your own icings, if you work in the bake shop at all, if you like to make gummy candies, uh, this is the temperature at which sugar gets to a softball stage. So you dissolve sugar in a little bit of water, you bring it to a boil, you let it continue boil, you have your candy thermometer, and then you can dip a spoon in the boiling sugar and pour it into cold water. When it chills, if you can take that sugar out and make a little ball out of it, that's your soft ball stage. Now, before we had our electric thermometers and uh, when I went to culinary school, we, we had thermometers then, but I was taught the old school style. Chef Jan Bandula uh, taught me that you pour some of the sugar in and you see it visually. The next 
at 255 Fahrenheit, 122 Celsius is the hard ball sugar stage. So now it's boiling more. You can see that the bubbles get smaller and smaller. You can see sugar get more viscous as it boils. You dip a spoon in, you pour it into some cold water, and now that ball should be hard. So if you like to make your own candies, that's the stage at which you would do it. At 270 degrees Fahrenheit or 132 Celsius, this is the soft crack stage of sugar as well. This is where you're going to start making making peanut brittle, uh, crack candies, cr crackly hard candies, things like that. And again, you can take a sugar in the water, you'll get more of a little sheet that floats on the water, drop it on the table, it'll crack. 320 Fahrenheit or 160 degrees Celsius, caramelization of sugars, the fourth of our four effects of heat on food. This is when uh, bread toasts. You put a piece of white bread in the toaster and you expose it to heat at 320 Fahrenheit. It comes out brown and brittle. It's caramelization of sugars. These are your grill marks on your hamburger. This is the nice brown color on your chicken breast or your tofu if you're sauteing inside. Very important temperature in cooking. 350 degrees Fahrenheit. This is where butter burns. Melts in your mouth at 93, but at 350, the milk solids in whole butter burn at this temperature. But saute often uses temperatures <clears throat> much higher than that. I mean, we want to caramelize sugars for sure, but a lot of times we use much higher heat in saute, in grilling, even in broiling. This is the reason that whole butter very often is not the best choice for high heat saute. Uh, you don't uh, use butter in a wok. Let's put it that way, right? You're gonna use an oil. Speaking of which, 360 degrees Fahrenheit or 182 degrees Celsius, extra virgin olive oil begins to smoke. And this tells you why using extra virgin, virgin olive oil in saute is a better choice than butter by 10 degrees, but the combination of the two might even be the best choice because you get the flavor of the butter, but you get the smoke point of the uh, olive oil. Or go ahead and clarify your butter. Remove those milk solids because that's what burns. Remove the water from your butter because butter is an emulsification of three ingredients. It's, it's not one. Break that emulsification. Take the butter oil, if you will. Now you've got a 480 degree Fahrenheit smoke point. Clarified butter is a much better choice to be sauteing with. Whew, there it is. It's the 26 most important cooking temperatures. And I know a lot of people are going to ask me for this last slide over here. And you are going to bombard our poor customer service rep. Hannah does not want to get your emails about where can I get it. Now is the time to take a screenshot. Okay. So if you want all of those, you do on a Mac control F4. Uh, on your uh, Windows based, you do shift print screen, I think, or do what you got to do to take a screenshot. All right, you ready? One, two, three, screenshot. All right. <laughs> now, now you have all the 26 temperatures in cooking. And you know, really this comes down to when you use a thermometer to quantify the results of your cooking, why are you guessing? When you have your own personal burger number or steak number, the exact internal temperature that is just right for you, then you add consistency. Then you cook every burger perfectly based on your burger number as a benchmark. That's what I said. Use your temperatures and you start to gain quantifiable knowledge and you end immediately so much in the guess of the guesswork in cooking. A thermometer is so much more powerful than a clock in your kitchen. That's why you should take your kitchen clock down, throw it away, and replace it with a, th with a thermometer. Don't really do that. Turn the clock around so you can't see it. Even better. Don't, don't throw it away. Um, all right, so let's stop and smell the flowers. Oh, very nice. What does that smell like to you? What does this flower smell like to you? Well, if you pulled the stamens off it, there's only three of them, pulled the stamens, it would smell like saffron. Uh, this is a saffron crocus. This is the purple flower that we get saffron from three little threads out of each flower. That's why saffron is so expensive, but oh, so good. Look, if you know somebody who's guessing and gashing, who's looking at a clock for their cooking answers, if you know someone who has more paper cuts than knife cuts because they're cooking with a book, <laughs> then you should share this video with them 
Uh, you should like it. You should love it as a matter of fact, because having quantifiable temperatures in your cooking is really empowering. And let me ask you, if you've been struggling, if you've been stuck in a rut with the same meals and limited variety, then you are going to love this week's free online class because it combines the step-by-step -step cooking methods that I've been teaching for decades with some new creative ideas that are going to get your juices flowing. So you then take what you learned today, take the 26 most important temperatures and cook it. Go take this class, this class, <laughs> go take that class and combine the 26 temperatures with the meal multiplier formula that I give you in this free class. Then you're cooking should be supercharged. So if you really were excited about what we talked about today, go to webcookingclasses.com slash multiply. The free class I'm holding this week is called the meal multiplier formula to get dinner done. And I share my six element formula for inventing meals on the fly. Uh, you don't want to miss this. Uh, there might be limited class times. I'm only going to be talking about this through this week. So go choose from the upcoming classes right now at webcookingclasses.com slash multiply. Cool. Until next Tuesday, where we take even more steps toward cracking that carefree cooks code. This is Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's a method to your cooking success.